Hey everyone, wanted to talk about something that I've been asked about a lot in the last few days. And if the frequency with which I've been asked about it in the past few days is any indication, I suspect there are many people who are confused by this topic. To illustrate this, I'm going to use a lovely little spreadsheet that Bob Kaplan put together. And we're going to stick this spreadsheet somewhere on our site. So the site is peteratiamd.com. And if you uh, go to the tab for COVID-19, uh, you will find all the content we've been putting up for COVID there and will somehow feature this prominently enough that you can start playing with it. And I truly encourage everybody to muck around with these numbers because uh, it does take a little while to become intuitively familiar with what sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value mean. So of course, what we're talking about here is testing. Now in this talk, I'm not going to get into the nuances of the actual types of test, but of course that's what's on everybody's mind. And just to sort of rattle them off so people have a sense of what's out there, you have PCR testing, uh, which stands for polymerase chain reaction that amplifies viral copies of RNA, makes DNA, and it allows you to very accurately um, and, and with great resolution detect um, viral RNA should it be present. Um, you have something called monoclonal antibodies. Those are not yet actually approved. They probably will be at some point, so I'll save any discussion on that until later. And then last, you have serological testing, which looks for the presence of antibodies, things that your immune system will develop in response to an infection. And we can look at things that become you know, lit up, so to speak, early, so-called IgM antibody, versus things that come to play later on down the line, uh, called the IgG antibody that would give us a sense of a previous infection. But let's park all of that aside for the moment and focus instead on the concept of sensitivity, specificity, and how they factor into positive and negative predictive value. So um, the first thing that you need to sort of understand is what sensitivity means and what specificity means. So sensitivity is defined as the probability of having a positive test should the tested individual have the condition at hand. So let's make that a bit less abstract. If you have a thousand people who are infected with the SARS coronavirus, the and if the sensitivity is 80%, you would expect 800 of those thousand to test positive, they would be a true positive, and 200 of them to test negative, they would be false negatives. Um, conversely, if you went over to specificity, and I made that 80%, um, you would get the reverse. In this case, we're tarting, tarting, starting with a base of 99,000 people who are not infected. And so 20% of those would falsely test positive, and 80% of those would truly test negative. So if you, again, play with these numbers, you'll see that as you drive up specificity, you drive down the false positives. So a 99% specific test will have only 1% false positives, whereas a 99% sensitivity test will only have 10% false negatives. Now, let's take a look at this example. Let's pretend you're dealing with a case of coronavirus where only 1% of the population is truly infected. So if we're talking about New York, that would mean that about 80,000 people are actually infected. Um, but the majority of New Yorkers are not. If that were true, how valuable would a test be that had a 99% sensitivity and 99% specificity? Because on the surface, you'd think, man, that is an awesome test. Well, it turns out your positive predictive value would still stink. It would be only 50%, meaning the likelihood that if you have a positive test, you have the coronavirus would only be 50%. It's hard to understand that for a moment, isn't it? But if you think about it, 
because in the situation I've described with a prevalence of only 1%, there are so few cases out there. And because I'm not allowing for us to just test exclusively symptomatic people, in fact, I'm specifically targeting asymptomatic people, which is a very important question, um, you're going to have the same number of true positives as you do true negatives. Now, the converse of that is, what happens if you test negative? Well, if you test negative, you can take that to the bank. You are, as sure as God made little green apples, free of coronavirus. Your negative predictive value is essentially 100%. I hope that makes sense. Again, play with the numbers until it does. But the teaching point here is, how does this change if the prevalence is higher? If the prevalence is 30%. So I'm changing nothing else except saying that 30% of the population has this. Well, now look what happens. My negative predictive value for all intents and purposes is still exceptional. Yes, it has come down slightly, from basically 100% to 99.6%. But more importantly, my positive predictive value has gone way up from effectively zero to about 98%. How is that possible? It's possible because now the probability of someone being positive is 30% instead of 1%. And therefore, when somebody tests positive, there's a much better chance, a 30 times higher chance in fact, that they are positive. So it's important to understand that this type of a model does not incorporate the Bayesian thinking that goes into testing people who are symptomatic versus asymptomatic. This is a helpful way to think about epidemiology at a large scale when we're trying to do baseline screening. Now let's muck around with the sensitivity and specificity numbers a little bit so you can see how they alter it in a high prevalence situation. So now we're gonna stick with prevalence of 30%, which again, these are the types of extreme estimates that we're seeing. Hey, 30% of the population has already got this. What are the implications for testing? Well, let's start by making this realistic because there's no such thing as a test that is 99% sensitive and 99% specific within the confines of what we are discussing. In fact, as a general rule, as a test becomes more sensitive, it becomes less specific and vice versa. So let's hang on to our 99% sensitivity and assume that we could develop such a test, but assume that our specificity takes a bit of a bath and goes down to 75%. What happens to our positive and negative predictive value in a high prevalent situation? Well, again, our negative predictive value, meaning if you get a negative test, your negative predictive value says you're very likely to be negative, that stays great. But your positive predictive value is better than a coin toss, but not by a lot. Let's take a quick look and see how that changes in a low prevalence situation, if at all. Yeah, it does. In fact, in a low prevalence situation, a low specificity test with high sensitivity is about as useful as a warm bucket of hamster vomit. It serves no purpose. And in fact, it should be interpreted with as much caution. Let's flip it around and take a low-ish sensitivity test and a high specificity test. In a low prevalence situation, you still have high negative predictive value because the prevalence is so low, virtually nobody has this condition. So even though you dropped your sensitivity, it's still okay from a negative predictive value standpoint. And by the way, sometimes that's all you need to know. But from a positive predictive value standpoint, it still remains abysmal. Okay, what happens when it becomes highly prevalent? Well, you guessed it based on what we saw in the past. Now, because so many people are walking around with this condition, your specificity starts to kick in and your positive predictive value goes up. Now, what's interesting in this example, at least to me, is that your negative predictive value didn't get obliterated. And again, that's because of the prevalence being so high. Look, I could go on forever and talk about this stuff, 
but I hope that this video at least gave you enough tools to go in and start to play with this toolkit that we'll put up so that you can start to understand what the sensitivity and specificity of a test mean in terms of actually testing people and based on what prevalence.